So uh, I'm Dr. Russell White. I'm one of the surgeons here at IndyVet. And um, today I felt like it was a good idea to talk about uh, brachycephalus, so our short face breeds, just because of the, the multitude of problems that they have um, with, um, in both surgical and non-surgical realm um, with, um, with breathing, with reproduction, with pretty much everything. Um, so today is certainly not a comprehensive list about all of the problems that brachycephalic breeds have, um, but some of the primary ones uh, that commonly present to us either through the surgery service or through emergency service um, and, uh, and what we can do about those um, to just better educate about the breed and, um, and the prob common problems that we have with these breeds. So when we talk about brachycephalics, um, you know, what are we talking about? So um, uh, brachycephalics, you know, it, it comes from uh, the term of, uh, you know, the Greek for short and, and uh, the Latin for head, uh, brachycephalic. So uh, basically it's this developmental um, disorder, development disorder, a developmental type of skull anatomy where um, they have a very short face and the skull becomes compressed in their development. Um, so, um, you know, we typically think of this as our, our pugs, our shih tzus, um, but even cats can sometimes be called brachycephalics, like Persians, exotics, that sort of thing. Um, and if you play around with Google Translate enough, you can get some Latvian words that kind of sound like brachycephalic to translate to horrible everything. And I kind of feel like that fits for these kinds of breeds just because of how many things can go wrong with them. Um, the, the most common breeds that we see, again, but with dogs and cats, um, bulldogs, pugs, Persians, Himalayans, um, uh, and, and, but we can also see some larger breeds too, like boxers and English mastiffs, depending on the, the confirmation of those breeds. Um, but again, we mostly talk about, and the majority of things that we're talking about tonight tend to be the smaller dog breeds, as well as some cats. Um, these breeds do uh, have a whole host of issues. Um, again, we're just talking about a small, small subset of those issues tonight, um, the six main ones on the, on the left side there. Um, you know, the most common ones that we see with these breeds, um, we'll talk about a little bit, um, but like I said, this is definitely not a comprehensive list of all the problems that brachycephalic breeds can experience. Um, and so, um, uh, but again, this is just kind of a, a, a quick summary of the more common things. So um, the first and foremost thing that we deal with with brachycephalics is obviously they need to come into this world and be born. Um, and so a big problem that we have is reproduction in brachycephalics. Um, because they, uh, because of the way their body is conformed, um, they have a big issue where um, uh, the, the size of the fetus may not be able to pass through the pelvic canal itself. So um, the big problem we have there is actually a term that I've stolen from human medicine, um, which is called cephalopelvic disproportion or CPD. Um, and that's where the size of the fetus, primarily the head, is too big to pass through the pelvic canal naturally. Um, because of the way that skull is, is squished backwards, um, it kind of widens the face, and very often the, the, the pelvis is not wide enough to allow um, those, uh, those uh, uh, puppies or, or kittens, whatever, to, to, to uh, be born naturally. So this does increase the risk for needing a, a cesarean section um, with, a, with a breeding of a brachycephalic breed. Um, and, you know, we try and, and talk about improving uh, the, you know, the breeding stock of brachycephalic breeds. And so, you know, obviously we try and promote breeders to pick, pick um, animals that do not require a C-section or can give birth naturally to, again, improve the genetics of the stock. That's not always the case. Um, but um, the necessity for C-sections is, is quite high in, in, uh, in brachycephalic breeds. Um, there's a big paper back in 2010 that looked at um, over 22,000 litters um, and um, of the breeds that were listed, 92.3% of Boston Terriers presenting uh, with uh, um, uh, needing, needed a C-section um, as part of their birthing plan. So, uh, you know, English Bulldogs, 86.1, French Bulldogs, 81.3. Um, so those are probably the top competitors for most common uh, um, uh, types of brachycephalics requiring um, a C-section. Um, Pug was down there at 27.4. So having, uh, being a brachycephalic does not mean that you need to have a, a C-section when you're born. Um, but the typical ones that we think about, Boston's English Bulldogs, French Bulldogs, those are probably the ones that we see the most frequently because of that disproportion um, uh, between the size of the pelvic canal and uh, and the size of the puppies themselves. Um, you know, we also see issues with, with small litters um, and, you know, the smaller, the, the uh, fewer number of puppies that are in there, 
um, the bigger they tend to be. Um, so again, that just kind of exacerbates the problem for, uh, for, for um, brachycephalics trying to give birth. Um, another more recent study looked at, um, again, uh, quite a lot of different uh, um, dystocias and trying to manage them with surgical and, and medical outcomes. Um, again, a large proportion of almost 20% of them were brachycephalic. English Bulldogs uh, and French Bulldogs were kind of the top, uh, top, top contenders for most common. Uh, brachycephalics in that study had a 1.54 times higher likelihood of needing a C-section than a non-brachycephalic breed. Um, and uh, that also increased if they were less than 10 kilograms. So our small brachycephalics, Boston's, French Bulldogs, uh, English Bulldogs, um, boxers, mastiffs, that sort of thing that have brachycephalic faces um, did not have as many issues there. Um, but, um, but again, those smaller brachycephalic breeds were increased risk for, for needing a C-section. Uh, the nice thing they found with this is that the likelihood of needing a C-section um, uh, once did not mean that they definitely needed a C-section later. Um, however, if we're needing a C-section because of CPD, where we have a too small pelvis and too large of a, a fetal head, that's not going to change on the next time around. I think this study more highlighted that uh, the uterus does not require a C-section the second time around. The puppies may, but uh, needing a C-section once does not mean that every litter beyond that point needs a C-section. Um, and so that's kind of a useful thing, not just with brachycephalics, but all C-sections that we perform. So, um, as far as needing a C-section, we also see in brachycephalics that um, birth defects are also more common with brachycephalic breeds. Um, and so uh, canines, almost five times higher odds of uh, developing a palate defect. So hard palate, soft palate defect um, uh, uh, on top of all the other issues that they have. Um, brachycephalic cats also have a big uh, increased risk for developing birth defects. Um, and so this is another reason if you, if you are doing C-sections and you're you know, helping whelp puppies, all that, um, it's really important to check these puppies for um, palatal defects, one, as part of their, uh, you know, of their uh, resuscitation after being born, and two, for the sake of mom. If we're having a lot of puppies with a lot of birth defects, um, that's one more reason to spay the mother while you're doing a C-section um, and, um, and take them out of the breeding stock because obviously they're producing some animals with um, birth defects. And so for the sake of, uh, of brachycephalic breeds, we want to try and improve the stock as much as we can. So um, consulting owners on the fact that, hey, your dog gave birth to a bunch of puppies with palatal defects, maybe you shouldn't breed them anymore. I would hope that people would follow that instruction, but they may not always. So um, as far as giving birth, um, you know, regardless of, of what kind of animal we're dealing with, timeliness is really important. Um, regardless of what you do, be it surgical or medical management of, uh, of a dystocia um, presenting for, uh, even if it's a brachycephalic or not. Um, you can attempt medical management for dystocias. Like we talked about, not all, uh, um, all brachycephalics require a C-section. Um, like the pug, you know, it's less common than the English bulldog. Um, so you can try your oxytocin, calcium gluconate, pulling, all those sorts of things. Um, but if you've got a brachycephalic, um, you should have that thought in your mind that, hey, this is, dog's more than likely going to need a C-section if we're having a problem at birth. Um, and so um, just being able to advise people that way. Um, like we said, C-section surgery is not, uh, doesn't mean that they are increased risk for needing a C-section later on in life, but if it's, you know, you can't change the size of the pelvis, and so if that's the issue, then obviously they do need to have a C-section for the second, second litter if they're doing that. Checking your palate defects on all, all the puppies that are born, and I, I really strongly recommend spaying for every C-section I do on a brachial palate just because if they're having difficulty with one breeding, they're going to have difficulties going forward if they're a brachial palate. Um, and they've got a pelvic issue, you know, uh, the, the cephalopelvic disproportion um, and the higher rate of congenital abnormality. So I, I always recommend spaying with a C-section. Again, not everybody's going to agree with that, um, but that's something that I typically recommend. So things to keep in mind. So, all right, we've got our puppies. They're born. They need to start breathing. So brachycephalics are, are, are pretty, uh, pretty well known for their issues with breathing. Um, and that has to do with brachycephalic upper obstructive airway syndrome or brachycephalic upper airway syndrome. So sometimes we talk about BOAS or BUAS, same thing. Um, the, the main components that we talk about with this are the elongated soft palate, um, stenotic nares, hypoplastic trachea, as well as everted sacule. So those are the more common. If you look up BOUS or BOAS, BUAS, those are the four things that you're going to find. But that's not all the whole story. There's actually a whole host of other potential components to the syndrome 
that we often don't talk about and are actually sometimes nearly impossible, if not impossible, to treat um, those conditions on top of that. So we'll talk about the main ones and what it means uh, and what we can do to treat those, um, but also some of the other ones that may complicate, even if we do everything surgically to try and fix some of those components, we may still have breathing issues at the end of the day. So um, the most common one that we, we talk about or think about um, uh, doing something surgically is an elongated soft palate. So because they've got compression of, of, of their skull, um, the soft palate doesn't really change its length. It just keeps going further back. Um, and so obviously that's a separation between the mouth and nasal cavities, um, helps to prevent aspiration of food uh, and, and um, uh, you know, liquid up into the sinuses, up into the nasal cavity. Um, and, um, and it causes an airway obstruction. If it goes back too far, obviously it's either going into the esophagus, which triggers regurgitation, or it's going into the larynx, which can cause some obstruction there. Um, and it has a pretty uh, a characteristic sound that we hear of the, you know, the snorting bulldog. Um, and that's that soft palate that they're dealing with. So we have a couple of different um, surgical techniques that we use. Um, I would say the most common historically is what's called the palatoplasty. Um, uh, in that we're, you know, surgically uh, affecting the, the palate itself. Um, historically, the most common one's been the staphylectomy or a soft palate resection. Um, and that's where we just go in and we resect a portion of the soft palate itself. We're making that soft palate shorter. It's not going back caudally as far as it would. It's not going into the esophagus, not going into the larynx. Um, and um, some people do it sharply with a, a scalpel and sutures. Some people do it with a laser. Um, there are some reports of using a ligature um, that does create a lot more char back there. So, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, we, we still are looking into different ways of doing these procedures and which one's the best um, kind of depends on, on surgeon, surgeon comfort as well as individual patients. Um, and um, so historically, like I said, that's been the one that, that most commonly is performed. Um, one that I've started doing um, that I feel like has a subjectively better results is what's called a folding flap palatoplasty. Um, and I'll show the difference between that in a little bit. Um, but rather than just worrying about shortening the, the soft palate, making it shorter, is I'm actually debulking a mass of, of the, the palate itself. Um, so I'm shortening it as well as making it less thick. So, and I'll show some, some, um, some uh, cross sections later on so you can see the difference between that. But end of the day, we're trying to just shorten that soft palate so it's not causing any really problems there. So... With a, um, with a soft palate resection, um, very often this is what you're gonna see in surgery is you've got this uh, elongated soft palate. You can see on the left there with the, the little dotted line of the intended incision of where they're gonna shorten the soft palate there just to start right where the epiglottis, uh, uh, um, uh, it's just there's a little bit of overlap between those. Um, usually pulling that forward, cutting it and suturing that close, excuse me, so there's, a, um, there's no open mucosal defect in that. Some people do simple erupted sutures, some people do simple continuous, um, but essentially at the end of the day, you're getting a shorter palate there um, and, um, and it seems to do the trick. Um, there are some issues that I have with that personally is that you're putting that suture line at the caudal edge of your incision or caudal edge of the soft palate. So that suture can cause some irritation, especially if you're doing something like a simple, simple erupted pattern where you've got a lot of knots, a lot of tails from knots hanging out there. And so I've started to do that folding flat palatoplasty, like I mentioned. Um, and I've got a couple cross sections to try and help uh, 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 illustrate that for you. So with the top left, that's, a, that's kind of the right before surgery, if we've got this really long soft palate that's going over the epiglottis there, that's really thick. Um, and it's usually, it, we'll talk a little bit later about why that is such a thick amount of tissue. Um, and um, just by shortening it, we're not really affecting the thickness of the tissue. We're just making it shorter. So the difference in this, in this procedure is that we're actually, we're still grabbing the, the caudal edge of the soft palate, we're folding it forward. And then you can kind of see where there's that little dashed line on the upper right picture of the planned resection. And then the lower left is the result. So we're debulking a lot of that tissue. We're maintaining the mucosal surface on the dorsal aspect of the soft palate, but we're moving it on the, on the ventral. And then we're folding that flap back over and suturing that close. So the result look from the, from the cranial portion is that bottom right picture uh, on the right side where you can see the suture line is actually cranial to the back edge of the soft palate. So by doing that, I'm reducing the size of the soft palate, both in thickness and in length. Um, and I'm also putting the suture line cranial to the caudal edge of that soft palate there. So I feel like subjectively causes a little less irritation of the, 
um, the caudal, uh, the, the airway. Um, as far as big studies that say that, yes, this causes less irritation, less regurgitation, I'm still waiting for those papers to come out to support me, but I, at least subjectively, I feel like there is less um, impact on post-operative complications, that sort of thing, by doing this, this technique there. Um, so again, I'm still accomplishing the same thing. I'm doing a slightly different way about it. Um, but this is one that, that more, more and more surgeons are kind of talking about with this procedure. Um, in a more emergency capacity, sometimes we can do what's called a palatopexy in that we're kind of stopping after the first two steps of that four page, four picture diagram, where it's a temporary tacking of the palate. So if we've got a bulldog coming in respiratory distress, we're going to see more and more of those uh, now that it's getting hotter. Um, where um, they're coming in, they're breathing so hard because they can't thermoregulate, and that soft palate is just getting in the way, getting in the way, and preventing them from being able to thermoregulate and, and cool themselves down. So um, what I've worked with some criticalists who, um, who have started doing this as kind of a temporary uh, fix, where they're grabbing that caudal edge of the palate, bringing it forward and tacking it to the hard palate, um, uh, or the soft palate on, on the hard palate there, just to keep it out of the way for a little bit. So you're not doing a, a, a platoplasty, you're not changing the shape of the palate, but you are getting it out of the way to get us through whatever crisis we're in, heat stroke, aspiration money, whatever it is, to get that out of the way so they can breathe a little bit easier. Um, again, this is a pretty new technique that with um, I'm working, uh, a criticalist I worked with previously is trying to get in cases for this to show that this is a good technique for emergency situations. Um, so stay tuned on that. Um, but this is one that we can use as kind of an emergent temporary fix and maybe do a platoplasty later on. Aside from the soft palate, most common thing that we fix is usually stenotic nares. Um, so our, our nostrils are too small. Um, I don't have to do this on every patient. It kind of depends on individual patients. You can see the variation there of size of nostrils there. Um, and um, a lot of that upper airway uh, uh, pressure comes from the fact that those nares are too small. They're trying to breathe through a coffee straw is what I tell people when I talk to them about these patients, is they're trying to suck all of their lung volume through a coffee straw and, you know, they, they just can't breathe enough through those. So trying to, uh, you know, surgically we would open those back up again, try and allow more air in there um, and, um, and uh, just to help with, with upper respiratory uh, um, effort that they need to put in. So um, as far as um, correcting this, we again have another couple different techniques that we can use. Um, the uh, um, the kind of historical one is called the trader's technique. And that's one where basically they just chopped off the bottom half of the little alar wings on the side there and let it bleed. And eventually it would granulate in and you get a, a quite a bit of blood after surgery. And um, I'm glad that we've kind of shied away from that just because um, I, I've heard, heard reports of patients actually getting clots obstructing their entire nose and, nose, and then it kind of backfires. Um, so I usually try and control hemorrhage as much as I can when I'm doing these, just because I know I can cause more problems than I can help. So I usually want to do what's called an, a wedge resection, where I'm removing a small portion of it and allowing that to open back up, but then closing it back up. So it, uh, closing my incision up so that it's not bleeding and it heals a bit faster that way as well. Um, other things that we can do um, are, are, are kind of uh, uh, salvage procedures after that would be called an alopexy, where I'm actually suturing that wing o o wider open. Um, I, don't, I, I haven't done that personally. I haven't heard of many people doing that. That, again, seems to be more historical technique. Um, and then there's other things like turbinectomies, uh, removing the turbinates within the nose themselves, um, within the nasal cavity. Um, that's something I've had myself. It helps a lot. <laughs> but as far as dogs, we're not doing it all that much. Um, right now. And so um, as far as, uh, you know, there's, there's things like laser, laser ablated turbinectomies that people are doing um, and that um, are growing in popularity, but again, are not very commonplace there. So um, as far as, um, uh, you know, when to do this is a common question that we get where, um, uh, and we'll talk a little bit later on about that, um, but there's some growing evidence that even if before a patient becomes, um, you know, really clinical for these, doing the nares early Allowing that, uh, that nostril to be open up earlier in life can potentially help with uh, some uh, uh, progression of the, uh, of, of the airway syndrome later on in life. Um, and so um, I usually talk to people about doing these as early as potentially six months. Um, uh, again, uh, we're trying to try as a community of surgeons, we're trying to get more evidence to support that. Um, so, uh, but that may be the direction that things are heading is to do these as early as possible maybe just doing the nares and considering the soft palate later. Um, so we're, we're still figuring out what the best timing of all this stuff is. Uh, 
Um, as far as the wedge resection goes, um, it, it's kind of what you would imagine. I'm resecting a wedge of the nose. Some people do a vertical wedge. I do a horizontal wedge. Um, but basically, you're removing a small triangular section of the, of the nares and suturing it so it pulls that, that nasal opening up. Um, the trick with these is making sure that you get your wedge to be caudal enough back so that you're not just doing the outside of the nose, but you're doing the entire, uh, the, you know, the, the, the entire um, uh, air passageway there so that you, um, not at least cosmetically, you're not just affecting the outside, but functionally you're actually improving airflow there. Um, and I would say that this is probably the most common one that I, I have seen and that I've worked with um, in, in the past. Again, historically, um, you know, we talk about uh, alapexies. It's accomplishing the same thing as a wedge resection, but instead you're, you're suturing the, the, uh, the alar wings outwards towards the muzzle. Um, this is not a very common thing. I had to look back at an old textbook page and even find this picture. Um, I mean, that's from a Jaha uh, uh, paper in 2004, which is probably the most common thing that I've seen. So again, this is not a very common one, but again, for those patients that are either non-responsive to a, a, um, a wedge resection or something else, you can use this as an, kind of a, an added technique as well. All right, soft palate, nares, now we're on to everted saccules. Um, so that's another common thing that we can see with brachycephalus. Um, and where this is, is it's, uh, uh, the saccules are kind of this blind pouch within the larynx itself um, between a couple of the cartilaginous and ligamentous uh, structures there. Um, and when there's so much um, uh, uh, upper airway pressure from stenotic nares, from, from um, elongated soft palate, those saccules are normally uh, uh, recessed, but they can become averted from increased air turbulence and pressure. Um, so you can re uh, consider removing those with a, with a sacculectomy, um, but it's not always present at brachycephalics, and there's actually a couple different papers looking at, do we even need to be doing anything about those and the debate about that? So um, when we're doing a, a, a sedated oral pharyngeal exam, um, you know, the everted saccules kind of show up at the base of the, of the larynx there. It kind of looks like a little butt sneaking its way out of the larynx. Um, and that's exactly where we see that, that, uh, that uh, eversion coming through. So looking at more pictures of the area, you can see on the left is a normal larynx with, with non-everted saccules. On the right, we do see those everted, everted saccules there. Um, and depending on how severe they are, they can, they can take up a significant percentage of the airway there. You know, this one's approaching 40, 50% 40, of the airway being occluded by these saccules. Um, and so, um, you know, in those cases, we consider something like a saculectomy, where we actually are going in and removing those saccules there to open the airway back up again. Um, I usually do these with biopsy forceps um, and let, allow them to heal by second intention. Obviously, I'm not suturing down into the larynx, that'd be very complicated. Um, but usually we just kind of cut them out or, or kind of divide them out and allow them to heal. Um, there's been several papers looking at sacculectomies and the outcomes and benefits of all that. Um, they, um, uh, uh, the more recent stuff says that, um, you know, we, we tend to see more averted saccules when um, we have uh, nasal stenosis or stenotic nares. Um, there's also increased the probability of everted tonsils, so not just saccules within the larynx, but tonsils within the caudal uh, um, uh, oral cavity. So that's kind of another one of those bonus components that I mentioned earlier, but we can see everted tonsils along with this, along with the everted saccules. Um, and so um, in that paper, they looked at actually dividing some of the tonsils to see if, if trying to you know, re uh, remove some of the everted tonsils um, can, can help uh, alleviate clinical signs. And they did not find um, that uh, there was a, a big complication rate change with uh, addressing the, the, uh, the saccules. Um, other papers, uh, you know, that uh, re in 2016 did find that there was no increased complication rate with saculectomy. Um, the more recent one in 2018, though, is they did find that postoperatively saculectomies did increase the, um, the complication rate. Um, and so um, that can be a big issue there. Complications they saw were GI issues, vomiting, regurgitation, aspiration, pneumonia, all the typical ones that we think of with um, with brachycephalic rates. So whether or not we need to do that again, jury's kind of still out. Historically, we do. If I do a if I do a brachycephalic upper airway uh, exam and I'm seeing you know 40 50 percent of that airway obstructed, I'm going to do a sacculectomy uh, just because subjectively I feel like it's going to help, um, but I may not do it in every patient that we have. So the last main component of brachycephalic syndrome is our hypoplastic trachea, um, and so that's one where there's a growth abnormality of the tracheal rings that makes their diameter much smaller. So on top, you see a, a, a X-ray of you know, bulldog. Most likely, you can see its trachea is probably about you know less than 25% of the of the height of the one below it. 
Um, and so pretty significantly, again, we've got that issue where we've got a patient trying to breathe through too small of a tube. Um, not only are their, are their nostrils too small, but their trachea becomes too small. Um, they often need a smaller ET tube than what's anticipated. Um, and, um, and it can cause a, a lot more issues. It's much more, more easy for them to become obstructed um, if they've got a smaller uh, trachea like that. There's no real treatment for that. You can consider stenting if it's collapsing, but that's not typically recommended. Um, tracheal stents are kind of end stage treatment anyway. Um, and so there's not really a great way to treat hypoplastic trachea other than weight loss. Making sure they don't have too much weight on them um, just because there can be fat deposition around the trachea pretty much everywhere. Makes it hard for them to breathe, for them to regulate. Uh, and so that's really the best thing that we can do for hypoplastic trachea is just keep them healthy weights. So the question becomes, all right, well, why do we treat any of these? Um, this is a great picture of a neurologist and a criticalist I worked with previously trying to save a brachycephalic recovering from surgery. Um, and obviously our patients need to breathe. Um, and so if we do have issues where our nares are too small, our soft palate's too long, we have issues where um, you know, it puts them into respiratory distress when it's 80 degrees outside and they can't thermoregulate. Um, uh, we've got snoring, we've got sleep apnea, um, you know, uh, we can have a cyclical problem where if they've got uh, uh, extra turbulence in their airway, it uh, can worsen airway inflammation that again causes more and more stenosis of the airway that again worsens inflammation, worsens turbulence. So it can be the cyclical problem that's hard to, it's hard to, um, to prevent or hard to break that cycle. Um, but it also can progress to things like laryngeal collapse or, or oropharyngeal collapse that we'll talk about in a little bit uh, as well. Um, if we've got this patient who for, for the, uh, their entire life is, is breathing this way and causing so much tension on their airway. Um, like I mentioned, you know, thermal regulation is a big one. Heat stroke is more common in the hotter months. Um, but we also can have some of the secondary, uh, 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 secondary issues like I mentioned. Um, uh, there are certain muscles that um, uh, have been found on necropsy and brachycephalus, primarily the sternohyoides and the, and the uh, palatinous muscles that are caused uh, because of the amount of turbulence that's put on them by negative pressure, trying to suck air in through little tiny coffee straw nostrils. Um, it actually causes necrosis and scarring of the soft palate itself. So as a result of that, we're having a palate that can't move normally. Normally the, the palate has a number of different muscles that can help it move out of the way uh, for swallowing, breathing, that sort of thing. And with necrosis scarring, it can't be as effective. So again, that contributes to further obstruction of the airway um, that can exacerbate that, again, causing that kind of cyclical problem of increased air turbulence that, again, causes more pressure inflammation of the tissues. Um, secondarily, we can have things like sliding hiatal hernia. Um, if they're trying to breathe so hard in that it's causing a big negative pressure within their chest, they actually start sucking their stomach in through their diaphragm to, to kind of fill in that negative pressure void. Um, and uh, we can have some links to, to gastrointestinal disease as well. We'll talk about that in that gastrointestinal section. Um, but, um, you know, not only are we treating respiratory stuff with all this, we're treating the entire patient. Obviously, they need to breathe and all that. But we can see a, a whole number of issues that kind of uh, uh, ripple out from this, this syndrome um, that can cause a whole host of problems. So as far as the surgery itself, um, you know, we, we do have some papers that say that, great, we, have, we, have, you know, we, we do a pretty good job of treating these. Um, and at least in my personal experience, a lot of, um, I think my success rate is very high if a patient survives the post-operative period. Because they can have such a high complication rate with aspiration pneumonia, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, any sort of breathing issues on recovery that may need a tracheostomy, um, as long as they survive that perioperative period, I think the outcomes are pretty good. And there's, there's a, a good host of evidence to support that. Um, usually, um, higher complication rates occur in, in older patients, dogs that are overweight, um, if they do already have presence of laryngeal collapse, uh, oral pharyngeal collapse, um, and, um, or if they've had a history of um, GI surgery, uh, or GI issues rather, um, you know, chronic, chronic vomiting, chronic regurgitation, those can, can uh, uh, increase our complication rates. Um, and um, so, yeah, so again, we have a pretty good way of treating this, but again, it's not perfect. And we still have a, a you know, can have a, a, a decent chance of mortality with these surgeries, even for patients that are coming in seemingly healthy, um, and within a couple of days, they've unfortunately passed because of the complications they're having. So um, as far as treating all this, we do a pretty good job with all this stuff, but there's still a lot of stuff that we can't fix with this condition. Um, because we have that squished face and that squished skull, we end up with a lot of abnormal skull anatomy. So 
The soft, soft tissues are primarily what we're fixing with brachycephalic airway syndrome, but we can't fix the underlying skull anatomy that well. Um, you can see from the CT of, um, I believe these were, um, uh, uh, these are all kittens, um, uh, Siamese cats that were, were CT, just to see the different um, abnormalities that you can see with them. Um, and um, they've got issues that are, you know, their, their interorbital inter bones are, deep, are indented. They've got asymmetry of the maxilla. Their, uh, their sinuses are all jacked up. They, they just can't breathe normally through their skull, let alone all the soft tissues that surround it. Um, and so even if we treat everything soft, you know, soft tissue on there, we can't necessarily fix a, 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 an abnormal skull like that. One thing we can do is address the nasal turbinate. So that is a, a secondary problem of abnormal skull anatomy. So we can do things like the laser ablated turbinectomies that I mentioned before, where we actually go in and remove the, the nasal turbinates or parts of the nasal turbinates in the sinus, in the nasal cavity to open up um, the internal airway. You know, we're, we're doing the external airway with the nares and the caudal airway with the soft palate. But in between, we've got nasal turbinates. So if we've got redundant turbinates, if we've got merely shaped turbinates, um, we can go in and try and, and debride some of those, remove some of those. This is something that, again, is a fairly new thing that we're doing. And, um, you know, there's not a lot of research out there that, 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 um, about case studies and that sort of thing. So, again, this is kind of a stay tuned for more on that. But this may be the direction we need to go for these patients that are not responsive to things like um, uh, uh, soft, tash, soft tissue, excuse me, soft palate resection, um, wedge resections in the nares, those sorts of things. So, um, uh, uh, that may be something we need to consider in the future. Other things that we start to worry about are um, epiglottic retroversion. That's kind of a new thing that's come up in the last few years. It's been kind of a buzzword in the surgery world um, about um, patients that are, um, that are presenting with obstruction of that airway because their epiglottis is actually getting sucked back to cover their airway um, kind of paradoxically. So normally when a patient's swallowing, the epiglottis comes back, protects the airway, so food can travel over it down the esophagus. Um, but with epiglottic retroversion, that, that epiglottis is actually being sucked back when they inhale. So they're trying to inhale air into their larynx, and the epiglottis is popping back up and blocking the larynx from, from being open, so they can't breathe. Um, I've actually talked with one person who thinks that something like reverse sneezing actually is epiglottic retroversion. Um, but as far as how frequent this condition is, it's really hard to diagnose because most patients that you induce for anesthesia can have some degree of epiglottic retroversion, but is that truly their state or is that because they're sedated uh, under anesthesia? So again, this is one that we're really not quite sure how to diagnose except for um, on something like this where it's a, a radiographic study of the epiglottis. You can see there that on the left is open epiglottis in its normal position. And on the right is actually when the patient's inhaled. So the epiglottis is, is moving back and it's causing an obstruction of the airway there with those airways. Um, there are things like epiglottopexies, epiglottectomies, where we can get the epiglottis out of the way. We can resect part of the epiglottis if this becomes a problem. But as far as treating this, it's definitely not a first line of defense. Um, we would try and exhaust all of the other surgical techniques we've talked about before. And if we're still having problems on top of that, we may consider the turbinectomy. We may consider um, doing something with epiglottis in terms of decreasing its size, doing a pexy, that sort of thing. Um, so again, this is one that's fairly new. Um, so stay tuned for more on that. I'm sure in the next few years, there'll be uh, more studies looking at this condition as well. Beyond that, we start to kind of get into the weird places of tongue size. Again, that's not typically something that we think about with brachycephalics, but we're trying to fit the same volume of tongue in a shorter face. And so, um, you know, we've got less skull for the, that, that tongue to take place. Um, and so um, in, in brachycephalics, we have this issue where our tongue's too big. Um, we have a, a proportion of the, of the airway um, is decreased by almost 60% compared to, to more normal shaped dogs. Um, and it's 10 times, 10 times more dense in brachycephalics than it is in, in non-brachycephalics. So we have this huge issue of we've got a tongue that's in the way. We can do all that we can for the airway, but what about the tongue? It's stuck in the mouth. Obviously, that place for air to come in the mouth is an issue. So do we need to start considering things like partial glossectomies and removing or debulking part of the tongue? Again, that's, that's kind of outside the realm of what we're doing now, but again, it's something to think about if, if this is what's happening, do we need to be correcting this problem to try and address those patients that don't respond to other more traditional surgical techniques that we have? Um, as far as you know, doing anything on a brachycephalic, again, the, the big thing I mentioned before is uh, a patient trying to survive the perioperative period. 
Um, so, uh, you know, it is more difficult for them to breathe. Um, and so, you know, typically we recommend leaving these patients intubated for um, much longer than we would a normal patient. Um, I've seen several patients walk around hospitals with an ET tube in because it's the best, best they've ever had breathed for their entire life. And so they're like, this is great. I don't want to ever get rid of this tube. It's fantastic. Um, and so um, that's something we, we leave that tube in for a really long time until basically they're chewing it out. Um, and um, so that they, we make sure that their swallow reflex and all that's intact before we extubate. Um, there is a, a potential need for tracheostomies in really severely affected patients. Um, so that's something I, I do warn people about before I do, even on the, the, you know, the normally healthy patient, the one that's a possibility um, as part of, at least for their recovery, allowing them to breathe a little more easily. Um, you know, things like the platypexies that we can do uh, for more emergent cases. Again, that's uh, something that we can consider um, as well as um, post-operative steroids. So I, I typically hold off on um, anti you know, non steroidals until I have a patient basically walking out the door and say, all right, when you get home, you have the first dose of NSAIDs. Um, just because I, I want to make sure that I can use steroids until they walk out the door um, just to help with immediate post-op inflammation, um, especially after doing a soft palate resection. Um, so sometimes we do need steroids to immediately decrease that inflammation so that they can breathe a little bit easier there. Um, so uh, like I did mention earlier, I, I warn owners about all these complications just because I've had cases that I think, you know, the, the relatively healthy, normal patient is coming in for, oh, we're just doing, you know, he's getting a nose job, he's getting his nose done. Um, and within 24 to 48 hours, they may have perished from post-operative complications. So I, I have a very serious conversation, even with, um, with fairly, uh, you know, what we would consider straightforward or uh, very healthy patients coming in for these procedures, just because they do have a higher risk for anesthetic complications, surgical complications, and unfortunately death, even in recovery after uh, these kind of procedures. So as far as making anesthesia as safe as possible, there's a whole host of different issues that we can do. Um, you know, we try and use drug synergy as much as possible to avoid um, uh, complications. Um, some people try to avoid and do opioid-free um, protocols um, just because that can cause nausea, ileus, hypoventilation in our patients that have problems with all three of those issues. Um, anticholinergics are kind of a, a double-edged sword where, um, you know, we do get some sedation from those, but it does cause increased respiratory secretion. So some people avoid those. Um, regardless of what you choose, I do think that, um, you know, things like short-acting or reversible medications are, are really helpful. Um, and um, just so that if we do have side effects from them, they're short acting or I can get rid of them as soon as possible. Um, and, and, and along with that, you know, trying to avoid different, uh, different pre-medications, things like opioids or benzodiazepines. I, I don't really like midazolam anymore just because it lasts for so long and it gets a lot of sedation. Um, and so I, I tend to avoid that um, for my brachycephalics. Um, there's increasing evidence to say that pre-treatment of these guys with gastroprotectants, anti-nausea medications, those sorts of things helps decrease uh, post-operative complications. So, you know, Serenia, Zofran, Reglan, Omeprazole, uh, you know, Sucralfate, anything like that, um, for even two weeks before doing a surgery on their upper airway um, can potentially help with that. Big things, gabapentin, trazodone for sedation, um, keeping them calm during recovery. That's really important. You can lose patients just by them becoming uh, panicky and breathing too hard and starting that cycle of inflammation and airway obstruction um, that I mentioned earlier. So that's a really, really important thing to keep in mind. Um, so there are some studies looking at, looking at using some of these medications to help with, with post-op complications. Um, and there was one that said that, yeah, great, we decreased our complications from 35 to 9%, um, but basically in that other 9% or the 35%, they didn't do anything. And then in the 9% th the complication rate, they used pretty much everything. So what, what one of those is really the most useful, it's hard to tell, um, but I do think pretreatment with some sort of uh, capacity of anti-nausea medications, gastroprotectants, what have you, um, I think that is also an important thing to talk about. So, all right, so as far as our patients, we've got, we're born and we're breathing. Now we need to function. We need to have a, a, a working neurologic system. We need a brain. We need everything else to be kind of kicking into gear as we're being born. So, um, We've already, we've hashed this issue over several times, but we've got our abnormal skull anatomy of, um, uh, for, of our brachycephalics. As a secondary to that, we've got a brain that's kind of, you know, it's a, it's a definitive uh, a volume that needs to fit into a skull. So if we have a skull that's too small and a brain that's too big, we can have a whole host of issues with that. So there's a couple of different um, uh, um, uh, uh, terms that we can use. Um, they're listed here. 
that I'm sure our neurologists would disagree with me on, on the, <laughs> the distinctions between these. Um, but as far as, um, you know, kind of the definition that we can use for, uh, for most brachycephalic issues with skull anatomy is that we've got a malformation of the skull where, um, and the cranial cervical junction where the skull meets the spine, where we have an issue with um, uh, affecting um, brain parenchyma, uh, as well as disruption of CFS or CSF circulation. So we have an issue where the brain tissue is being pinched and the CSF fluid can't flow properly. Regardless of the, the you know, minutia between those, those definitions, that's kind of the definition that we need to think about with brachycephalics. Um, and, um, you know, we normally think of um, things like um, um, cavities that have, have big issues with, um, you know, syringal myelia, that sort of thing. Um, chihuahuas with hydrocephalus, that sort of stuff. But we can see those, those conditions in, in um, brachycephalics as well. If we look at how a shortened skull can affect that brain, um, you can see from the top left, there's a whole host of issues that can happen because that skull cavity is much smaller than or differently shaped than it normally is. Um, that can affect a whole host of things. And even on the bottom, the blue is what a normal um, skull would look like, and the red is the brachycephalic. So it's shorter, a little bit taller, but basically trying to fit the same volume in a, in a different space and how we can have that effect, um, you know, be pinching on the caudal brain tissue as well as disrupting CSF as it's flowing out of that back part of the skull there. So there's a couple different things that we, well, main one thing that we can do with this, with this condition um, and that's a, a, a foramen magnum decompression, an FMD. And that's where we actually remove that caudal portion of the skull there to open up that skull so it's not pinching on the, the, um, the cerebellum, that caudal part of the brain there, as well as the brainstem. Um, pretty good outcomes with this. You know, we get about 80% improvement for those that are affected by this condition. Um, but there is a, a fairly high relapse rate. Um, so um, some people put in um, uh, some protective bone mesh or uh, something like that to help prevent scarring of that tissue down and compression of that brain tissue later. Um, but, um, uh, and again, this is only for, for patients that are affected caudally. There are some that you, there's, you need to remove the entire skull for the brain to, to be able to function properly. So this is definitely not for all patients, but for those that clinically it would be help with, um, that's, uh, this, this is kind of one of our, our, our only, our only treats, treatments for this. I mean, this is not something that I do typically. Uh, this is probably more in the neurology department, but, um, but as far as the surgery goes, you know, we're making a dorsal incision, a dorsal approach to the skull. We're, we're burrowing away part of that skull there. Um, and then if we are putting a mesh on there just to protect that area, that's what that would look like there. So um, as far as complication rates and that sort of thing, again, I kind of forward that on to Dr. Mosin, uh, our neurologist, but, um, but again, just something to keep in mind. There, there may be a treatment option for those kind of patients. So. Um, one other thing that we can see uh, fairly commonly with, with brachycephalics and their, and their neurologic function, um, I've got a short video um, of a bulldog here. I'm hoping this is going to play. There we go. So um, we've got a bulldog that um, is laying in its bed, and um, you know some people do mistake this for seizures. They see their dog kind of twitching all over the place. Um, but you can see through this video that the dog's responding to the owner. Um, he's looking around. He's alert the entire time. Um, he is still kind of having this abnormal shake, um, but he's following the owner around. He's following the other dogs. They're going to the kitchen right now for dinner. Um, and so um, you can see him kind of follow the owner and pay really close attention because he really wants his food. Um, and you'll see in a second, one way to help differentiate this from something else is, is when the dog gets a, a, a piece of food. So all the other dogs obviously are, are watching as well very t intently. Um, camera work is just on point. Um, but the dog's shaking, 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 gets the treat, stops shaking, licking the fingers. As soon as the treat goes away, goes back to shaking again. So this is something that we, we um, some people will see their, their um, brachycephalic breeds where they have an issue there where they, they feel like, oh my God, my dog's, my dog's seizuring. Oh my gosh, you know, I got to get on anti-seizure meds. Um, but what this dog is actually experiencing is idiopathic head tremors. So that we can see in brachycephalics where it's not a seizure activity, they just can't control the fact that either they're doing, you know, a nod, they're doing a shake side to side. Some can be rotational. Um, and it can start and stop spontaneously. Um, patients are alert the entire time um, and they, they respond the entire time while they're doing this. So it's not, you can differentiate that from a seizure by the dog who's having a seizure is non-responsive or they're post dictal and they're kind of spaced out. Whereas this dog was very intently going to the kitchen, very intently having a snack um, and was awake the whole time. 
So um, in a lot of these patients, um, in, in this paper in 2015, um, distractions stop these head tremors in 87% of patients. So that's kind of a useful thing you can have owners say like, all right, well, if they're alert, try giving them a snack. Does it stop? And it's most like these idiopathic head tremors. Um, they cannot, you know, age of onsets between three months and 12 years. Um, you know, most have had an episode before four years. Some can be episodic. Some can be, you know, longer periods of time. Um, most of the patients in this study were bulldogs. Um, so that's typically who we see that in. So um, again, it's not typically one that we need to do much about, not typically associated with other neurologic disorders, um, doesn't really increase the risk for euthanasia or death other than owners just freaking out about it. Um, and so that's something we need to keep in mind. Um, and it doesn't really respond to anti-seizure meds. So as long as owners are aware of what to look for to differentiate that from seizures, um, that's a, a helpful thing to teach them of, um, of, of their bulldog maybe experiencing those things. Um, other than their head, obviously they need to move around. And so, you know, we need their spine to work. We need our, our vertebrae to, to protect our spinal cord as it's going down. Um, the issue that we have with brachycephalics is hemivertebrae. So this is where vertebrae don't fuse into the nice box shape that they normally are. Um, and we can have things like trapezoidal vertebrae or the number of different shapes that you see on that picture there. Um, basically, that's just a developmental issue of the vertebrae where they form these weird shapes and that causes increased pressure on the, the spinal cord itself. Um, we can see this um, with brachycephalics. The reason why we have corkscrew tails and pugs and that sort of thing is because of hemivertebrae. Um, and so unfortunately we've kind of bred that into the, into the, into the breed. Um, but we can see, also see it in pointers and German shepherds. So it's not just, just brachycephalics, but it is something we can see in other breeds. Um, what that typically looks like on x-rays, um, you know, we can see it in the, in the caudal vertebrae like that, uh, you know, usually we have these nice really long vertebrae in the tail, but in this dog, um, we've got that little trapezoid there and that's going to cause a, a curve in the tail. So if we have enough of those, the tail's going to curl around and cause an issue there. Um, elsewhere in the spine, it can also cause some issues. So in this particular case, uh, we've got one, you know, right in the caudal thoracic vertebrae where it's causing this just left turn, um, you know, probably around T10 or something like that. I haven't counted, but um, that can cause a huge pressure on that part of the spine and can cause a big issue. Um, that also causes an increased strain on the discs between the vertebrae, potentially increasing risk for things like, um, like IBDD and, um, and, uh, and issues there. So um, again, if we see a patient like this who has this condition, who has a severe kink in their back or something like that, Again, that's a good reason to get them spayed or neutered, take them out of the breeding population so they can't pass that on to the next, to the next uh, generation. Um, but that is um, you know, something to keep an eye out for, for especially dogs that have increased risk for, for IBDD. So we're born, we're breathing, we're moving, um, and now we need to see where we're going. So we gotta see what we're doing. A lot of brachycephalics unfortunately have um, uh, you know, kind of the bulging eyes because the eyes can't fit in the skull. So we've got exophthalmos for a lot of these guys. Um, you know, we, uh, as far as uh, increased risk for that, we do have increased risk of issues like eye trauma, um, chronic ulceration or corneal lesions in these breeds. Um, and so some that just because they can't always close their eyes, their eyelids properly. So big things with this, you know, again, that's uh, outside the, the realm of surgical stuff, making sure anytime you do a procedure on a brachycephalic that you're lubing the bejesus out of the eyes, get those eyes moist, make sure we're not causing any sort of ulcerations or warning owners that, you know, they are more prone to trauma, um, you know, if, if they're going for a hike or something like that, um, that they can traumatize their eyes more easily. Um, other things that we can see, you know, cherry eyes, a typical one that, that we see with bulldogs or, or other brachycephalics. Um, we can see entropion, ectropion, uh, sometimes some trachiasis from the nasal fold there. Um, Dr. Kleiner, ophthalmologist, would love to talk to you about a number of these conditions, I'm sure. Um, so I won't delve into that too much uh, during this, this presentation, but it's, again, it's another thing to keep in mind um, with, uh, with our brachycephalic patients of things we might see them coming in for. So, all right, well, we can see, now we can see the food bowl. So now we got to eat. Um, and so um, the gastrointestinal system of brachycephalics is a very common uh, uh, issue um, for them in terms of regurgitation, vomiting, that sort of thing. Um, with, with dentition, um, you know, we do have this very strange skull. And so as a result, we're going to have things like an underbite with, um, with maxillary hypogenesis, um, you know, dental malocclusion, dental crowding, um, and a lot more wear and tear on the teeth themselves, um, just because they don't have the normal alignment, uh, between the teeth. So, um, you know, making things like, you know, uh, uh, chewing dental chews and that sort of thing, not as effective. Um, and so they may need more, um, dental, dental issues as well. 
or dental dental care. Um, the most common thing though is if you Google brachycephalic gastrointestinal disease, this is one of the first things that pop up is why does my French bulldog throw up? Why does my, my bulldog throw up water every time they drink? Why can't they swallow? All these other things. So um, we do see a great number of gastrointestinal signs from brachycephalics. Um, and some of them can be very chronic. So, um, uh, you know, we do see regurgitation, sometimes vomiting, um, can be episodic. Sometimes it's related to excitement. Um, a lot of it um, has to do with that soft palate. So if, if they're starting to swallow their soft palate, that can trigger regurgitation, can trigger vomiting. Um, and so that's where that upper airway issues that we talked about before can start to impact our GI signs is by, by causing a, a temporary obstruction um, of that upper, uh, upper GI tract of the esophagus. Um, we can see things like diarrhea, loose stool, if there's underlying GI disease or allergies in, um, in brachycephalics. Um, and then there's always the funny uh, excessive flatulence. If they're, if they're having trouble breathing, they're going to swallow more air, so they're going to have increased flatulence there. So that's, again, something that I'm sure all brachycephalic owners are aware of, unfortunately. Um, as far as the GI signs themselves, they can increase the risk for aspiration pneumonia. Um, if we've got a dysfunctional upper airway and we've got regurgitation coming through, the normal passageway out the mouth may be obstructed or have an issue of getting out. And so the next place for that food to go is down into the lungs, and that can cause some issues there. So um, that's something that we need to keep in mind. Um, there's a very interesting set of presentations at ACBS a couple years ago um, that talked about um, brachycephalic disease and GI issues kind of being hand in hand, which actually affects which. So uh, there was one study looking at dogs with brachycephalic airway syndrome, and they collected GI biopsies or gastric biopsies from these dogs. 98% of them said chronic gastritis. Um, after performing those airway surgeries, soft tissues, uh, soft palate resection, nares, uh, 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 nasal fold opening, 100% um, of those dogs within that study had histologic resolution of their gastritis on follow-up biopsies. So we've got upper airway causing increased turbulence, causing all of this negative pressure, causing inflammation of the airway, but it actually seemed like it's starting to impact the GI tract as well, primarily the stomach. Whether that's because of slight and hiatal hernia, because of increased turbulence, unsure. But the fact that he did see resolution of this chronic gastritis on biopsy of the stomach after, after doing surgery in an entirely different anatomic system, we gotta start thinking about maybe we, you know, we're correcting the airway, not just for the airway, but for everything else. Um, other things we kind of see it actually going in the reverse direction. So if we've got chronic regurgitation, that's also causing irritation of the airways. Um, if there's regurgitation going up in the nasal cavities, that can cause scarring, irritation, stenosis and contribute to that cycle that we talked about earlier. So again, this, this, this inflammation can go either direction, from the airway down or from the GI up. Um, other things that we see are, are things like um, uh, contribution, contribution to otitis. If we've got chronic regurgitation, our eustachian tube from our, our um, you know, nasopharynx, oropharynx, going to the, uh, the middle ear, we can see stenosis dysfunction of that eustachian tube. And so that can, again, contribute to things like otitis. So, We've got this whole host of things that are just intermingled that is impossible to separate these, these things uh, apart. And so um, again, which of these is coming first? Is the airway affecting the GI that's then affecting the ear? Is the ear, you know, you know as far as you know, which comes first, it's hard to tell sometimes with these patients. So um, regardless though, that was a recommended that we treat, pre-treat with gastroprotectants for at least two weeks before surgery may decrease complication rates in patients that have things like uh, 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 regurgitation postoperatively. It may at least make them um, uh, you know, less life threatening. Um, additionally, we have things like hiatal hernia, like I mentioned before. Um, and um, uh, you know, there's different levels of, uh, of herniation. The most common that we tend to see um, is, um, is the type two um, in brachycephalics. The different types are more common in, in people. So that's where that, that classification scheme comes from. Um, but um, this can be acquired. So if we've got upper airway, um, upper airway issues there, that can kind of suck the stomach through the diaphragm, like I kind of mentioned before, um, or um, uh, or it can be uh, um, acquired. So they or, or, or um, traumatic rather. So they can have a traumatic hiatal hernia there. Um, and so um, so that's something we need to keep in mind for those patients that have chronic GI issues. Is this a hiatal hernia that's contributing to that? Um, the trick behind that is it's diagn diagnosing it's really difficult. Um, this tends to be a dynamic process that you can catch on some x-rays and not others. So just because a patient has a normal x-ray does not mean they don't have a hiatal hernia. So um, I've, I've, uh, there's a number of different papers looking like 
at looking at different ways of diagnosing that. Um, maybe using a, a wooden spoon and pushing on their abdomen to try and push the stomach back up through the diaphragm while you're taking x-rays um, or doing live um, fluoroscopic studies, something like that. You know, may need to do something like that to diagnose that. Um, and um, so this can be a really tricky one to diagnose um, uh, just based on the fact that it can come and go and, and be episodic like that. If we do diagnose that, things that we can do to, do the, to, to um, decrease that herniation there, uh, we can reduce the, the hiatus, so you know, closing down the hole through which it herniates. Um, uh, we can do things like an esophagopexy, um, where we're suturing the esophagus to the diaphragm um, to help prevent it from sliding back and forth. We can do a left-sided gastropexy, pulling the stomach caudally so that it doesn't go cranially through the diaphragm. There's no real set technique for how to do any of this stuff, so unfortunately it's kind of seat of the pants, each individual patient's different, um, but, um, but th those are kind of the best options we have. Unfortunately, there's no guarantee that any of those are gonna work. So I've had a number of patients that have confirmed hiatal hernias uh, in the past. We've tried a couple things and it really doesn't seem to work. So, uh, you know, it, it, it may help in some patients, but certainly not in others. Um, and so again, that's, we need to set owner expectations that we could do all this and still end up at the same place at the end of the day, um, which is really unfortunate. We just don't have great ways of treating, diagnosing and or treating this um, right now. So, all right, so we, we're born, we're breathing, we're seeing, we're moving around, we're eating, um, and, uh, and now we just need to exist. And so <laughs> that's kind of where we come to our last, our last category here, and that's just skin. Uh, and so um, a lot of bulldogs, a lot of brachycephalics can have issues with allergies, seasonal dietary, what have you. Um, and so that's a, 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 a good thing to keep in mind for brachycephalics there. Big things that we can also see are things like skinfold dermatitis, with especially on their face, if they're trapping moisture in those skin folds, we can get some pretty nasty infections in there with, with yeast, with bacteria. Um, and so, um, you know, sometimes we need to talk to owners about using little wipes to clean the areas out and, uh, and help dry that, that area out or deal with focal infections. Um, so, uh, you know, as far as more, acute, more extreme cases can go, we can do things like uh, dermal fold removals or trying to remove those sources of skin super gross, don't really like to do it, <laughs> but it is something we can consider for those really extreme cases. Um, more commonly though, we're gonna see things like otitis, ear infections. Um, and um, you know, with that abnormal head anatomy, um, there is an increased risk for uh, uh, things like otitis. We've got smaller ear canals. Um, we've got a hypoplastic tympanum that separates the, outside, the outer ear from the middle ear that can allow more, um, uh, you know, uh, more translocation of bacteria through the membrane, that sort of thing. Our eustachian tube may be dysfunctional, kind of echoing back to our GI issue earlier, where chronic regurgitation can affect eustachian tube disorder, uh, function and contribute to otitis there. So, um, you know, uh, the most common thing that we do with these is perform a TICABU, or, or a, a, a total ear canal ablation and lateral bull osteotomy. Uh, my technicians know this is probably one of my least favorite surgeries to do. Um, but it's one where basically we're removing that entire ear canal, removing the entirety of the irritation from the, from the area um, and, and opening up the middle ear to scoop that out, try and get as much of that secretory tissue out as possible so that, um, you know, we're, we're removing this, that source of infection there. Um, one thing that I do warn owners about in brachycephalics is that because we are um, uh, uh, performing a TIG that's right next to the, uh, the airway, the pharynx, the larynx, we can have swelling there that actually can cause um, a kind of a temporary obstruction of the airway because it's swelling, it's compressing the airway. Um, and there's reports of non-brachycephalic cats and dogs actually needing things like a, a tracheostomy after a tigaboo just because they've got respiratory issues, respiratory distress. So most certainly if I've got a brachycephalic who's going through this, I, I warn them up and down that, you know, we may need a tracheostomy if, if they're in recovery. Um, and if I've got bilateral disease in a, in a brachycephalic, I refuse to do bilateral tigaboos at the same, you know, at the same time. I only do unilateral and I stage it. Um, I've actually lost a patient who I did bilateral tigaboos in um, who was a brachycephalic and they just couldn't recover. Um, and so I, I don't do that anymore just because of the, of the high complication risks that we can have with these patients. Um, so that's something, again, if we've got a patient who's come to us for um, chronic ear stuff, you know, uh, we want to warn them about all the possible complications. Um, and um, again, it's that kind of like, all right, well, now the ear disease is affecting the airway disease, which is not something we typically think about. Um, but all this, unfortunately, is connected. 
Um, other things that we can see with skin, um, you know, things like screw tail. We've got those hermy vertebrae that are turning the tail around. Um, and in cases of screw tail, actually the tail can kind of turn 180 degrees and um, cause issues, uh, uh, per, uh, can penetrate or lacerate the perineal skin. And actually can, um, uh, I've had a number of really gross cases where it actually goes into the anus, causes obstructions there, becomes horribly infected. Um, and traps moisture in there, gets, uh, gets infected uh, deep to the tail in the, in the, the tail folds. Um, usually we treat those with a caudectomy or amputating the tail there, kind of giving them a nice round butt uh, around where the tail base used to be. Um, and that typically solves the problem. So on average, we, you know, we think of tail amputation more like this, where we've got a nice long tail, we're just leaving some of the tail there. We make these nice V incisions and kind of close it up and it looks great, blah, blah, blah. With a, with a bulldog, obviously that's not the case. We've got this really short tail with really messed up vertebrae in there. And so um, we, we have to make this rather large incision around it. Sometimes we do need to cut the vertebrae with some bone cutters to amputate that. Um, you know, cleaning it out, cleaning it out, cleaning it out. Any sort of infection there obviously can cause issues. Sometimes we need to put drains in if it's a really bad infection. Um, but um, usually they respond pretty well to this surgery. So that's something that luckily is a, a, a fairly well responded to treatment. So as far as everything goes, we'll just kind of recap real quick on everything that we talked about. Um, with, uh, with our brachycephalics with, with reproduction, most Bulldogs, most Boston Terriers are gonna need a C-section when they're presenting for dystocia. Um, you know, really strongly recommend spaying individuals that need that C-section um, just because um, you know, if, they, if they have those reproductive problems, if they have issues with their skull being too big and their pelvis being too small, they're gonna pass it on to their offspring. Um, and as well, if you've got birth defects, palatal birth defects in, in, their, in their offspring, um, really re recommend spaying those individuals at the time of a C-section, um, would, would really be strongly recommended. As far as the respiratory system goes, you know, we've got a multifactorial disease that we only have so many surgical treatments for. Um, so, you know, we, we can try and treat as many surgical things as we can, but very often um, those, uh, th those uh, there are some patients that just don't respond to those because we can't treat things like the tongue being too big, uh, oral pharyngeal collapse, um, nasal turbinates, you know, redundant turbinates, those sorts of things. We're just not treating those yet. Um, and so we may not be able to fix everything. Uh, anesthesia selection is really important for those patients uh, for the procedure as well as recovery. Obviously we want pain control to be under uh, you know, top priority, but we want recovery to be just as important um, in terms of making sure our patients can recover and survive the post-operative period during that time of really high complications. Um, we can consider things like palatoplasty, palatopexies rather for um, respiratory distress cases. Um, and, but again, just highlighting to owners that there's a number of things we can't fix. And so um, shapes, skull size, tongue size, epiglottic retroversion, those are things that are still um, kind of in the early days of being implicated for brachycephalic airway syndrome and, and how we fix those, uh, you know, we just don't have great answers for yet. Um, as far as eyes, you know, we can't have multiple ocular issues due to their, their skull shape. Um, just make sure you're taking extra care to lubricate eyes of brachycephalic patients to avoid, you know, causing any sort of iatrogenic problems. Um, as far as neurologic uh, issues, we can see that CLM, that Chiari-like malformation, um, that may require surgical correction to, to, uh, uh, to prevent it from contributing to um, secondary issues like syringomyelia uh, hydrocephalus. Being able to differentiate between seizures and idiopathic head tremors is a really important thing and can affect uh, owner's um, you know, uh, interpretation of how their patients do, how their pets are doing. So educating them on the difference and how to be able to tell, can you distract them from it or can you not? Um, just to help, uh, you know, so we don't have uh, emergency cases of idiopathic head tremors that we can't do anything about um, uh, coming to our doors as well as your own. Um, as far as you know, hemivertebrae in brachycephalics, we may see that with um, increased risk for uh, intervertebral disc disease, mediating uh, things like surgical correction, um, that, uh, that, that, you know, just to keep in mind for those patients that we see on x-rays, hey, you've got a hemivertebrae, maybe talk to them about increased risk for, for, for disc disease. Lastly, with, with gastrointestinal signs, you know, sliding hiatal hernia can be difficult to diagnose. Um, and even if we treat it, it may, it may not resolve all of our GI signs. We can't have respiratory signs contributing to GI signs and vice versa, it can go in, bo in both directions. Um, and so, you know, uh, you know, the, the, those conditions can require long-term medical management if the surgical options aren't available or if they don't work. We can do those surgeries and it still may not fix everything. So that's a really important thing to prep owners for is we can do all the things in the world, but because these breeds have so many things wrong with them, they may not be able to, to respond to it. And then the lastly, you know, we've got things like skinfold dermatitis that should be avoided. 
try and uh, encourage owners to practice good skin hygiene. Um, Tikaboos may be needed for otitis. Um, I definitely stage them in brachycephalics due to that increased risk of airway inflammation um, and even warn people of non-brachycephalic uh, uh, pet owners um, that, that things like tracheostomies, that sort of thing may be a remote possibility. And then things like caudectomies, if we need those for screw tail, that's another thing that we talk, commonly treat them with um, if we've got to the point where it's causing a big infection back there. So um, as far as, um, I've got a couple questions on here, so that's kind of it for me. So if there's any other questions, feel free to add them to the chat. Um, right now I've got a question that is, um, how much of the soft palate do you remove? Um, does it ultimately end with a space between the soft palate and the epiglottis? Um, typically how much we need to remove is a little bit different for each patient, but usually where I, where I aim for is to have the soft palate slightly, uh, ca the, the caudal edge of the soft palate, just um, caudal to the cranial edge of the epiglottis, if that makes sense. So just a little bit of overlap between them. Um, and um, so that, uh, uh, you know, there is still a little bit of, of overlap, but so that the epiglottis can still freely move caudally when they are, uh, when they're swallowing. Um, and so it's not getting stuck ventral to the, the soft palate there. Um, and kind of rule of thumb too, is that if you've done your resection, you should be able to see the larynx fairly easily without having to scoop the, the soft palate necessarily out of the way um, when, they, when they take a big breath in. So um, kind of rule of thumb there, you know, there's no, you know, as far as what I need to remove from each patient is a little bit differently, but that's usually the landmark that I try and go for is, is a little bit of overlap between those. Um, as far as, um, there's another question about post-op feeding instructions for a surgery like, uh, 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 for a surgery in the back of the out, uh, mouth, like a uh, uh, soft palate resection. Um, I typically hold off on food for, um, you know, 12 to 24 hours after surgery, uh, just because it's putting less food in there for, for them to regurgitate or vomit. Um, and I want all that, that immediate inflammation to die down some before I'm putting food back there. Once I do feed them though, I typically go for kind of the meatball, um, you know, trying to swallow large portions of, of solid food pretty quickly. Things like liquid foods, um, you know, kibbles like that can kind of get stuck everywhere. So I try and avoid that. So that's typically what I would, would do is, is feeding meatballs, you know, a couple at a time, 12 to 24 hours after surgery, just to make sure that if they are gonna have a complication, it's usually within that 12 to 24 hour period. Um, and so avoiding, you know, the, the, the confounding factor of throwing food in the mix of things they might throw up and, and, and cause further issues there. Um, if there's any other questions, like I said, feel free to, to, to throw them in the chat there. I'll try and answer those as best that I can. All right, well, um, if there's any additional questions, you know, feel free to get in touch. Um, and um, you know, I'd be happy to talk, talk more uh, to individuals about surgical options, different cases of specifically. Um, and, uh, you know, anything that, that uh, I might be able to help with. Um, so I, I do appreciate everybody tuning in and, and helping out, or, you know, tuning in and, and listening. And, um, and uh, it's a very interesting and very complex topic. Uh, so I hope everybody learned at least something. And, um, and like I said, I'm, I'm always available to talk more about specific things. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to, to set up an email or a phone conversation with anybody. Um, so anyway, again, thanks for coming and, uh, and have a good rest of your night.